Uh, okay, good. Uh, let me start. So today we'll talk about uh, epidemic models on networks. Uh, I think this needs a uh, little motivation today, so I will start right away with the models. Uh, so we are going to look at uh, two main models. The first is called the SIS epidemic or the contact process. Uh, and uh, I'll now give the description. So we start with some uh, graph G, uh, which I'll assume to be connected and undirected. <clears throat> Uh, you can always relax these assumptions. So we'll think of the nodes of these graphs as the agents, the individuals in the population. <clears throat> and then each agent can be either healthy or infected. <clears throat> Whenever they are healthy, they are susceptible to infection and we'll denote that state by S. And if they are infected, that state is I. <clears throat> uh, Okay, and uh, how does this process evolve over time? We are going to construct it in a similar way to all the other processes we did. <clears throat> we'll put independent Poisson processes, and in this case, we are going to need them both on the edges and on the nodes of the, well, of the graph. So on each edge, we have a Poisson process of rate beta, uh, and at each vertex, we have a Poisson process of rate one. So there's no loss of generality in that. We have scaled time so that the rate is one on the vertices and beta is proportional to that. Uh, okay, so what happens now? The edges correspond to transmission of infection. So uh, whenever there's an increment for the Poisson process on an edge VW, if the vertex at one end of this edge is infected, it passes infection to the other vertex. If both are healthy, nothing happens. If both are infected, then also nothing happens because they are already infected. Okay, so that's how infection spreads. <clears throat> uh, and then when the clock at a vertex rings, if this vertex is infected, it recovers. It becomes healthy again. So nodes become spontaneously healthy after some random exponential time with mean one. And while they are infected, they spread infection to other nodes. So that's the model of the SIS epidemic. Okay, and uh, what happens when a node becomes healthy? It's immediately susceptible to infection. There is no period of immunity to the disease, but immediately it can again become infected. So that's the first model. The other is called the SIR model. Uh, S again stands for susceptible, I for infected, and now R means recovered or removed, and we'll come to that. So the network is as before. Now the agents can be in one of three states, and the third state is removed or recovered, and the process is constructed the same way. Uh, so on each edge, you have a Poisson process of rate beta, and at each vertex of rate one, these are all independent. And when the vertex, sorry, when the edge clock rings, infection goes from one side to the other. Okay, so now what happens if this node is infected and this node is susceptible, the infected node infects the susceptible node. If the other node is also infected, nothing happens. But if the other node is removed, then again, nothing happens. Once a node is removed, it plays no more role in the epidemic, it's frozen. It's in the removed state forever. Okay, so I should say uh, what happens when the vertex clock rings. So if the vertex is healthy, nothing happens when the clock rings. If it's infected, then it moves to the state R. It recovers from the infection uh, or it dies. So the state R corresponds to either recovery or death. Uh, if you recover in this model, you're immune forever forever or for the season or whatever time period over which we are studying the epidemic, for that period you are immune. So you will never again get infected and you play no role in the infection. So, so you can remove the node. Okay, obviously from the point of view of uh, health, it matters whether the person recovers or whether the person dies, but from the point of view of mathematics, it makes no difference. They are the same thing. So we call both these states R. 
uh, and so the vertex is removed if okay or the uh, agent at the vertex is removed and the vertex plays no more role in the epidemic once it's removed okay so that's the model so those are the two models we are interested in uh, and what are the questions of interest? So the way we have described it, it must be clear to you all that these are Markov, Markov processes. Uh, and the state space of the Markov process is the state of configurations. We have to keep track of every vertex. Is it healthy? Is it infected? Is it removed? So depending on the model, it's either SI to the V or SIR to the V. These are, this is the state space. So it's a large state space exponential in the size of the population. So even though in principle, all these Markov chains, so these Markov processes can be solved numerically in practice with a population even of a few hundred, this is not realistic to do explicitly. Uh, okay, and what are we interested in? We want to know what happens in the long run. And uh, okay, nothing much can happen. Uh, in the SIS model in particular, nothing much can happen. So here, eventually, so if you reach the state in which everybody is healthy, then infection can never come back into the population. It's a closed population, uh, so you, you cannot uh, bring infection back into the population. So this state is absorbing. Once you reach the state, you are absorbed there. Uh, okay, and uh, the state is also accessible from all other states, so eventually the Markov process hits this absorbing state. Uh, okay, looks like there's nothing interesting there. Uh, but the question then is how long does this take? And this is, this is the question we want to answer. This is the challenging question. So does this happen very quickly? Do, do we, uh, does the population recover from the epidemic quickly or does it stay for a long time in the population and what how does this depend on the graph g and how does it depend on the parameter beta of the infection rate uh, so in the sir model there is not just a single absorbing state there's a whole family of absorbing states so once there are no infected nodes the infection again cannot come back into the population but you can hit the state of <clears throat> no infected nodes in many different ways. So you can have different numbers of healthy vertices and removed vertices, and these are all absorbing states. Uh, again, you eventually hit this set. And so you can ask two different questions here. You can ask where in the set does the process get absorbed? So maybe what fraction of the population is removed, meaning what fraction of the population ever got infected in this epidemic? Is it 1%? Is it 50%? Uh, you want to ask that. And then uh, also you might also be interested in how long it takes, but in this case we are going to be more interested in the size of this final set, how many people ever got infected. Okay. And we are going to address both these questions in a limit in which the population size goes to infinity. We'll look at a sequence of networks growing with them, and we'll try to address the questions in that setting. Okay, but before doing that, uh, I want to, uh, yeah, some remarks first. So uh, these models are obviously very simplistic for real epidemics. There is uh, the, uh, there was just a healthy state and an infected state and, and maybe a removed state, but uh, in, a, in a real epidemic, it's more complicated. People get infected. There is a period of time during which they may be infected but cannot spread the disease. Uh, after that, they become infectious. They can spread the disease. Uh, but are also suffering the symptoms and then they may recover from the disease but can still spread the disease that happens with tuberculosis for instance so depending on the disease there are lots of different things that can happen uh, but even though these are very simple the, these are widely used with some modifications they are not quite they are of course used widely by mathematicians but also by epidemiologists working on uh, real uh, real modeling uh, but okay, epidemiologists also refine these models in many ways. So just as an example, there is this so-called SEIR model, 
where the agents first go from susceptible to exposed. And an exposed state is one in which you have uh, acquired the disease, but you, can, you cannot spread it. So, and then you spend some random time in this or latent period in this exposed state. And after that, you actually start being infectious and you can spread it to others. And then eventually you recover, etc. So if you compare this with the SIR model, it doesn't uh, change how many, uh, what fraction of the population becomes infected, but it just, it does change the time course of the epidemic. So uh, the epidemic will be more stretched out over time. Uh, and uh, when, when people are trying to estimate parameters, this is what, uh, this is one of the important things epidemiologists want to do in the early stage of an epidemic. They want to make predictions and things like this can make predictions harder. Uh, okay, you can generalize the model to non-Markovian settings. You can, uh, it's common to generalize, especially the time spent in the infected state, not to be exponential, but to have general distributions because uh, biologically there's a lot of evidence for what this behaves like. Uh, so we so we really know this, and this is uh, a common generalization. The spreading is often still treated as Poisson, uh, but the time spent is treated as infectious. Uh, sorry, in the infectious state can be general, and also during this time that you spend in the state, you, your infectiousness may not be constant. So that that parameter beta may be different on the first day after you're infected, the second day and so on. So you can generalize the model in all these ways. Uh, you can have age structured populations, how you, you are more or less susceptible to the disease depending on your age, you recover faster or slower depending on that or other demographic variables, uh, male, female, ethnic group, etc. Uh, you can have spatial structure. This is important in a lot of epidemics. You may not, it may be unreasonable to model the a whole country as everybody interacting with everybody else, but maybe that's reasonable for a city or a large neighborhood of a city. And then you want to uh, uh, combine, the, think of the country as a set of cities with some long range random links, et cetera. All the parameters, uh, infection rate, recovery rate can depend on seasonal effects, temperature, humidity, things like that. The disease may be, you may have to have it transmitted through some insect or some other intermediate stage. And Okay, so for real epidemics, there are many, many other things you have to take into account. Uh, we won't go into any of these for the mathematics, but uh, it's useful to know that these things should be done if that's what if you're really modeling a disease spread and in many ways this is not actually hard to do uh, and I'll briefly comment on that in terms of the models epidemiologists use we won't go into this in so much detail but I think it's interesting as background so I'll cover it uh, so this uh, this field started in the early mathematical epidemiology started, I think, around 1920 with this model of Kermack and McKendrick. Uh, they, they gave a differential equation model uh, at the population level for the number or the proportion of agents in each state. Uh, so let's so we assume a complete graph that any pair of agents can interact. And let's denote by S, I, and R the number of agents in each of these three states. Okay. Uh, so what happens? The number of infected individuals uh, increases over time. Whenever a susceptible individual transmits, uh, sorry, whenever an infected individual transmits the disease to a susceptible individual. So beta is the rate for each such transmission. There are I infected and S susceptible individuals. So this is the total rate at which somebody who is susceptible becomes infected. And every infected individual recovers at rate one. So the number of infected decreases at rate equal to the number of infected. So that's I. 
So that's the first equation. S decreases whenever S becomes I. So this is just the same first term. Now it increases the infection, infected and decreases the susceptible by the same amount. Okay, and everybody who recovers from infection becomes removed. So what decreases here increases in the recovered compartment. And if you add all three equations, you get zero as you should because this is just the total population which is constant over time. Uh, SIS model is very similar. The, there is no transition from S to R, but only from S to I. So this is the change. Okay, so very easy equations. Uh, these can be solved explicitly. So you can solve them in closed form, uh, at least for the final state. Uh, the, and okay, even, even maybe for the time course, so these can be solved analytically. Uh, so we'll just look at uh, the long-term behavior. So what happens in the SIS model? Uh, you can notice that it has two fixed points. So if you set all the derivatives to zero, you have two solutions, uh, provided uh, beta times the population size is bigger than one. Okay, so beta is your infection rate and n is the population size. Uh, S equals zero is always uh, an absorbing, uh, so is always a fixed point of these differential equations. Uh, if uh, nobody is susceptible, sorry, this should be I equals zero. Uh, sorry, I equals um, zero. The, yeah, both these should be in terms of I. I equals, no, no, no. Sorry, let me stop a second. Um, uh, okay, so S equals N is a fixed point. So then I equals zero and these equations are the zero. So that's one fixed point. Everybody healthy is a fixed point. And the other fixed point is when uh, S equals one over beta. Okay, so beta is behaving like one over n now. If beta n is say 1.5 or two, then beta is uh, one, two over n. So one over beta is n over two. So uh, you have another fixed point where the number of healthy individuals is not the whole population n, but only a fraction of the population. Okay, uh, so that means the remaining fraction of the population is either infected in the SIS model or removed in the SIR model. Uh, so if beta times N is bigger than one, you can either be in a state where everybody is healthy or you can be in a state where a fraction of the, a positive fraction of the population is infected. So there are two fixed points. Uh, if beta n is smaller than one, there is still such a second fixed point, but now that means S is bigger than n, so which cannot happen. You cannot have more than the population, full population being uh, susceptible. So this second fixed point doesn't exist and zero is the only fixed point. Okay, and if beta times n is bigger than one, then you can check the stability of these fixed points. Uh, S equals N, everybody being healthy is an unstable fixed point. Uh, and a fraction of the population being infected is the only stable fixed point. Okay, so this, uh, so what this says intuitively is that in this setting, if beta N bigger than one, the population tends to be in a state uh, in a steady state where some fraction of the population is unhealthy always. Okay, and yeah, similar comments to SIR. Uh, okay, so nowadays everybody has heard of the term R0. Uh, so what, what is R0 for this model? So uh, beta is the infection rate uh, and we are assuming a complete graph. N is the population. So <clears throat> Uh, R0 uh, in epidemiology is the number, so if you start with a population where everybody is healthy, then R0 is the number of people a single individual will infect be before they recover. 
So here an individual is recovering at rate one, it's infecting each neighbor at rate beta, there are n or n minus one neighbors. So beta times n is the total infection rate. So this is how many people you infect before you recover. And what these uh, differential equation models are capturing is that if you start with, uh, uh, if beta n is bigger than one, so if R naught is bigger than one, then there is a fixed point where there is always infection in the population. The all healthy state is unstable and you will get to this point where a fraction of the population is infected. And this fraction also has, uh, now everybody has heard of this, this is the herd immunity threshold for the population. Uh, so this is how many people, so the solution for I is how many people you need infected or recovered uh, if you want to get to this uh, uh, herd immunity setting. Uh, okay. Uh, was that a question? Uh, Ganesh, I'm sorry, Sergei. Uh, yeah. So you said that I equals zero is a fixed point, not S equals zero, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And then in the line where is your cursor is beta N is bigger than one, then S not is S equal not is an unstable fixed point. This should also be N, sorry, both these are mistakes. S equals uh, N uh, should uh, be, uh, yeah. Both, both these zeros should be N. N, yeah. And why it is unstable? Everybody is healthy. Everybody is healthy, but now if one, somehow you introduce one infected individual into the population, the infection will spread exponentially. So unstable means uh, in terms not unstable, in terms uh, it's uh, unstable with respect, not to time, but to perturbation. Yeah, yeah, with, exactly, yeah. So the stability has a various meanings. So here means unstable if we perturb, if we change the initial state. Yeah, I think that's what for differential equations unstable uh, means. So I'm talking, yeah, I've switched from stochastics language to differential equations uh, language. Uh, now. So, so you have to say what the stability here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the language of differential equations, a small perturbation to the fixed point means you won't come back to the fixed point, but you'll go away from the fixed point. And uh, it's unstable because uh, beta is big enough, uh, beta and greater than one. Yeah, because beta is big enough, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so even this, what this, okay, so this, I guess, uh, summarizes a lot of what, many countries are trying to do with COVID. Uh, we know we, uh, yeah, so we want to do various things to decrease beta with various interventions because without doing anything, this is an unstable fixed point, but we want to make it a stable fixed point and stay with zero, zero infections rather than uh, exponentially growing infections. Uh, okay, so that is some uh, very, so this is already, we learned something interesting even from this extremely elementary model. Uh, and we can, uh, because it's just a differential equation model, this uh, we can quite easily make it more realistic. So you can include lots of compartments to uh, account for age, spatial structure, time varying infectiousness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, then it becomes a differential equation, not in dimension two or three, but in dimension uh, a few tens or maybe even a few hundreds, but that's not hard to solve numerically. We can do, it was hard in Kermack and McKendrick's days, but today it's easy, so we can do this. Uh, so the challenge then for epidemiologists is not to solve these differential equation models, which is easy, but to to try and parameterize them because now you, as the size of the model grows, there are more and more parameters. So what is the rate at which 20 year olds are infecting 50 year olds, uh, et cetera, and how do each of these recover and so on. So there are a lot more parameters in the model. Uh, and these kind of differential equation models are useful once the uh, proportion of infection has become big enough. So uh, somehow when the law, the law, these kinds of laws of mass action are reasonable. Uh, 
but in the very early stages of an epidemic, what's called the outbreak when it's just starting out, then stochasticity is more important. And also network models are useful when we want to take account of population structure. So for instance, populations are organized in households and households, there may be somewhat bigger units like schools or workplaces and all these we can take into account in network models. So that was quite a lot of background on differential equation models and now we'll start more on the kind of stochastic network models they are, that we are interested in. Uh, okay and finally the, for epidemiologists the big challenges are in picking the correct model and doing estimation of the parameters but solving the model is easy for them. But for us, uh, it's going to, once we go to stochastic network models, we are going to brush all the difficulties in the statistical estimation under the carpet and say, let's try to solve this very simple model. Uh, okay, so now there is, so that was one community in epidemiology. Now there's this whole other community in interacting particle systems, which has been looking at these processes. And most of the work has been on what's called the contact process or the SIS epidemic. And mainly they studied it on lattices. So the graph now is the infinite lattice and D dimensions, integer lattice. And uh, so there's an edge between nearest neighbors, meaning if you uh, differ in at most, sorry, if you differ in exactly one coordinate by at most one, then there's an edge. Uh, okay, and let's start this system with finitely many infected nodes somewhere, uh, doesn't matter where. Uh, and now, uh, when, when the graph was finite, it was guaranteed that the infection would always die out, but now this is no longer guaranteed. So we can ask the question, uh, does the infection die out with probability one, or is there some positive probability that it remains in the network forever? And it turns out that there is a, there is a phase transition for this. So what happens is that there's some critical infection rate beta C, beta critical. So if beta, the infection rate beta is smaller than the critical value, then the infection always dies out with probability one. Okay, it doesn't depend on the set of initial infectives. If it's one or a million, so long as it's finite, it always dies out. Uh, and if the infection rate is bigger than this critical value, then it survives forever with positive probability. Okay, not with probability one, just some positive probability, depending on how big beta is and on the initial condition. Uh, okay, so there is this uh, sharp threshold from uh, dying out with probability one to surviving with positive probability. Uh, and okay, what that this was uh, shown by Harris and then it was open what happens exactly at the critical value and Besweed and Houghton Grimet showed that in, indeed the infection dies out at criticality. Uh, uh, okay, we are going to be interested not in infinite lattices, but in finite graphs. And it turns out that uh, you can see this phase transition even on fi large finite graphs. So if you start with a very large lattice, say one n to the d or minus n n to the d, uh, then you can ask, let's say we start with uh, everybody infected, uh, then we can ask how long does it take uh, for the infection to die out so that everybody becomes healthy. And this time shows this sharp transition. So if beta is smaller than this critical value, then the epidemic lifetime is logarithmic in the number of nodes. So very quickly, the system recovers from the epidemic in log n time. But if beta is bigger than this critical value, even by a tiny bit, then the lifetime is exponential in n to some fractional power, n to some alpha, which alpha depends on how big beta is above beta c. Okay, so, so you have this sharp 
transition in the epidemic lifetime on large finite networks for a small change in the infection rate. So just below the critical infection rate, you very quickly recover and just above it, uh, the infections remains in the population for a long time. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the background and that's the system we are going to start looking at. So uh, do similar things happen not just on lattices but on other graphs? So we'll try to answer that question today. Uh, so we we'll look at uh, uh, general uh, finite graphs, uh, let's say connected because we can study each connected component separately so we'll assume it's connected. Uh, and uh, so let's look at the Markov process describing the epidemic on the graph. So Xt is the state, is the configuration of the state Xv of each vertex at time t. And we'll denote the state to be 1 if the node is infected and 0 if it's healthy and hence susceptible at time t. Okay, so this is the notation we are going to use from now on. Uh, and okay, so X is a Markov process. We can write down the transition rates. If you started some configuration X, what's the rate at which you move to one more vertex V becoming infected? Uh, so that for that to happen, this vertex should have been healthy to start with. Okay, and then you have the sum. Okay, so a symbol has disappeared here. So if W is a neighbor of V, so you have the sum over all neighbors, uh, beta times xw. So uh, V can get infected by each of its neighbors W at rate beta provided W is already infected. So V gets infected at rate beta times the number of infected neighbors it has because each of them is infecting it at rate beta. Okay, and it's recovering at rate one. So this is the Markov process. And what we are going to be interested in is the random variable tau, which is the first time that the epidemic has died out, the extinction time of the epidemic. So what can we say about the random variable? And we'll mainly just focus on the expectation. So can we get bounds on the expectation of this random variable and show whether it's small or large? Sorry, Ganesh, uh, am I right mm -hmm. that uh, now we deal with the first model, SIS model, yeah? Yes, we are on the SIS model, sorry, yeah. Contact process or SIS model. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so for the SIS model, how long, what's the time tau, starting in some initial condition until every node is healthy? Okay, so first we are going to derive a bound on upper bound on this extinction time for an arbitrary connected graph, undirected graph. So we'll denote by A, it's adjacency matrix. So this matrix is a square matrix, one row and column for each vertex. Uh, and the UV element is one if there's an edge between U and V and it's zero otherwise. So it's a symmetric matrix. Uh, it's non-negative. Uh, okay, and uh, the quantity that's going to play, one of the quantities that's going to play a role is the spectral radius of this matrix or its Perron eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue in absolute value of this matrix, uh, which is some, uh, in fact, there is a positive eigenvalue rho because it's a non-negative matrix. Ganesh, sorry, what is on the main diagonal? Uh, the main diagonal is zeros. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, the main diagonal, this is the adjacency matrix. The main diagonal is zeros. This is, uh, yeah, many of you may also be familiar with the Laplacian matrix, but this is not the Laplacian. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so now we have this theorem on the upper bound of the epidemic lifetime. Uh, so suppose that the infection rate beta times the spectral radius is smaller than one. 
then our first result says that for arbitrary initial conditions, the mean lifetime of the epidemic is approximately logarithmic in n, the number of nodes. Okay, there's a constant, additive constant and a multiplicative constant, but essentially it's of order log n. Uh, so what this is saying, so this is similar to uh, the results we saw earlier for infinite lattices. So this is saying that if, okay, we don't yet know if there's a critical threshold for beta, but this is suggesting that if there is one, if there is a critical threshold, then beta C is smaller than one over rho or maybe equal to one over rho. So if beta is smaller than one over rho, then the epidemic threshold is small. Uh, sorry, then the epidemic lifetime is small. You recover quickly in logarithmic and end time from the epidemic. Okay, is the statement and what it's intuitively suggesting clear before we turn to the proof? Yeah, okay. I think it's clear. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so the proof is going to depend on a coupling. We are going to uh, dominate the epidemic by another Markov process. And this is the branching random walk. So let me define the, uh, describe the branching random walk model on this graph G. Uh, so for the epidemic, each vertex was either zero or one, zero to be healthy, one if it's infected. Now we are looking at a model where there is some uh, number of particles at every vertex. It could be zero, it could be one, it could be more than one, it could be 20. So somehow this is counting how many infected particles there are at that vertex, if you like, and it doesn't have to be just one. And each of these infected particles or agents behaves the same way. Uh, so let's look at the second equation first. So each infected agent recovers at rate one. So if there are YV particles sitting at V, which are infected, the, each of them, the rate at which the number of infected decreases by one is the number of infected particles. So each recovers at rate one. Similarly, each of them is spreading infection to its neighbors at rate beta. So the number of infected particles at V goes up at, by one at rate beta times the number of infected particles at all its neighbors. Again, missing symbol here, but that's what this is saying. Uh, okay. Uh, so why, why do we call this a branching random walk? You can also think of it this way. So. Uh, there, there, each particle does a branching process combined with a random walk. So each particle dies at rate one. While it's alive, it has children at rate beta along at each neighbor. So uh, if I have uh, D neighbors, I have children at rate beta times D in total. And beta, I, I have children at each neighbor at rate beta. So that's the picture. So every time you branch, you also move to your neighbor, one of your neighbors chosen uniformly at random. So this are, Ganesh, I'm sorry, these mm -hmm. are independent uh, uh, dynamics, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every particle is behaving independently, yes. Yeah, and there are as many particles as uh, you like at any node, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there is no upper bound on the number of particles. It can be... You, you, have, you, have not, you did not match yet branching random walk with what you, you, you discussed before. It's, it's, it's a completely new, to, new object, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, I'm just introducing this model. So we have not seen this object before. This so is... So, so you have independently, people are whatever species or individuals are, yes, are living for a random time, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and when they, 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 they die, yeah? They might die, they may produce offspring. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, it's very, it's a completely different model, a new one, because you introduced several models already, and so I just want to 
uh, to make a pose uh, to yeah 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 it's a bit uh, dense yeah if uh, i can slow down if anybody Mathematics, but in terms of mod modeling, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, okay. So it's a completely new model where we have, uh, yes, on a graph, you have a dynamic on a graph, and at each time you have a configuration, and uh, uh, y, y of t is a vector, whatever, or a collection of random variables particles and each particles uh, has the following dynamics if a particle blah blah yeah okay that's what you said okay yeah so why is counting the number of particles at each vertex which could be zero or some positive integer and each particle behaves independently like a branching process uh, but you, it doesn't have children at the same vertex it has children at its neighbors and it has rate beta of having children at every neighbor while it is alive. And after exponential one time, it dies. Okay. okay, and so we can ask the usual questions that we do about branching processes. Is this uh, process going to uh, become extinct after some time? To, does everybody die or will it continue forever? Will the, pop will the population keep growing exponentially and survive forever. So it can do either of these things, just like branching processes. Ganesh, can I interrupt you again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially, if you, people may see about the following, if there is, if say, T is a, a lifetime of particle, and then T has exponential distribution with parameter uh, one. Uh, one, yeah. And then during this time, given this capital T, uh, yes, this uh, <laughs> this particle produces uh, okay Poisson number of, of offspring, yeah, yeah, uh, and this rate beta times its degree, beta times its degree, and what is its degree? The number of neighbors in the graph. Okay, so if if I have five neighbors, then my, my, my rate is five, yeah? Yeah, one five to beta. Each, one to each. Uh, sorry? Uh, uh, so we rate five is my uh, rate, but I rate one to each of neighbors, yeah? Yeah, 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 Ex exactly. Rate beta to each of neighbors and rate five beta in total. Yeah, or in other words, I have, uh, uh, if, I, if I'm in one of these uh, vertices, and I have, there are, there are five uh, edges which go from me, uh, yes, uh, to, uh, yes, then in each direction, I produce a Poisson, uh, uh, process, a Poisson process of offspring, yeah, of children, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. During my lifetime, and this process are independent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just just to stop to to, to, to understand maybe the yes uh, yes I'm just asking. Uh, no, that's very helpful. I'm sure a lot of uh, people yeah. have that question. Yes, yeah. I'm just. I, it's unclear to me. Is is the model clear to students to colleagues? Pasha, Jenny. Yeah. Uh, for for me, it's clear. Marina, what do you think? It's clear. Okay. Maybe someone have an, another question for about this model. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, okay. So, and then, yeah, the question we will ask is uh, uh, indeed whether this uh, branching random walk is going to become extinct or whether it's going to survive forever. And for a branching process, you know this answer already, whether the mean number of offspring is bigger than one or smaller than one will determine that. But here that somehow it interacts with the network because there are some places where the offspring rate is bigger and some other vertices where it's smaller because it's different at every vertex. So it's, it's a bit more complicated than this standard branching process, but that's the question. Okay, and then uh, why, why did we introduce this completely new model? Uh, we did it because 
uh, we can bound the epidemic process X by this branching random walk. So we can couple them in such a way that if the initial conditions satisfy this inequality, then this inequality is satisfied for all time. Uh, if you start out with uh, as many, with the same individuals in the two things or fewer infected in the epidemic, then there will always be fewer infected in the epidemic than in the branching random walk. Uh, again, the question is, X naught may have only zero and one coordinates, yeah? Mm -hmm. And Y naught may, it's a, it's a vector of, or oh, whatever, a collection of non-negative integers. That's right. Yeah, so it means if you put in this inequality, if you put minimum and one and y for any coordinate, it will be the same, yeah? Yeah, it, uh, it will be the same. Yeah, it will be the same. The, the, the same conclusion that, yeah, so you may replace y, vector y by minimum of um, uh, y and zero, uh, y and one for at any coordinate, yeah? And you, you, you still have the same property. It's actually the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because x can only be 0 or 1. You can replace y by minimum of y and 1 on the right, and these inequalities should still hold. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it may take some time to convince yourself that indeed such a coupling can be constructed, but hopefully that shouldn't be too hard. Uh, if it's true at some time, then the rate at which at any vertex infections are happening in the epidemic is here you have the sum of beta times xw, so that's smaller than the rate at which infection is happening in the branching random walk. So uh, the branching random walk is growing faster. The recovery could also be happening faster if there are 10 individual, 10 particles at a site in the branching random walk, they are decreasing at rate 10, whereas this is only decreasing at rate one in the epidemic. Uh, but that's okay. As soon as they, it starts out bigger, it can come down more quickly. But once it comes to one, they have the same rate. So after that, again, it's the same rate. So hopefully that's convincing enough why there's such a coupling. Okay, uh, so, uh, so this is the heart of the proof once you have uh, constructed the coupling. Okay, so let's define by tau tilde the time uh, for this uh, branching random walk to hit the all zero state. And I'm going to start it in the worst case, which is the all one state, uh, the worst case for the epidemic. So the epidemic might have started with everybody infected. So I'll start the branching random walk with one particle at every vertex and ask how long does it take until this branching random walk becomes extinct which may never happen, this might be infinity, but let's look at the case when it does happen. Uh, so this is uh, tau tilde, and so the coupling tells us that the lifetime of the epidemic is bounded above by the lifetime of the branching random block. So the, the reason for introducing this new process is that uh, if you look at its expectation, it satisfies a linear differential equation, whereas the epidemic itself was a nonlinear process if you took expectations. So let's understand this equation. So what's it saying? Uh, if you look at a specific vertex V, uh, the expected number of particles at vertex V uh, is increasing uh, at rate beta times the number of particles at all its neighbors. So that's beta times the adjacency matrix is giving you a one for each neighbor. So it's beta times the number of neighbors of V comes from the adjacency matrix. So that increases the number of particles and it's decreasing by one at rate equal to the number of particles because each is dying at rate one. So that's the identity here. So this capital I is the identity. So you get this matrix differential equation. It's a linear differential equation. It's easy to solve. So it's just, you have here this matrix exponential uh, times the initial condition, which may be deterministic. It's the all one vector. Uh, okay. 
Uh, and the event we are interested in is that this process uh, has not yet become extinct by time t, that its lifetime is bigger than t, but that's this event is equivalent to the event that the number of particles is at least one. It's integer valued, so if it's not zero, it's at least one. Uh, so these two events are the same. And so we can take the probabilities on both sides. The probability of the event is the probability that this random variable on the right is at least one. And so by Markov's inequality, it's bounded by the expectation of this random variable sum of yvt. Okay, so that's the expectation of that random variable. Uh, and then if we write this in vector notation, it's the all one vector times this uh, expectation of the vector configuration. And we have the solution for that already. So it's, uh, it's this quadratic form. Here you have the matrix exponential of beta times the adjacency matrix minus the identity. And then you are looking at uh, the all one vector on both sides of this matrix. Okay, so this is the bound on the lifetime of the branching random walk. Okay, so just a bit of linear algebra. So let's denote by the lambda i's the eigenvalues of this matrix. It so happens they are real because this matrix is symmetric. Maybe that's not relevant. The largest one is real, that's what matters. Okay, but then, uh, by the way, the matrix exponential, uh, I'm sure it's familiar to everyone, but it's defined in the, you take the Taylor series for the exponential and apply it to matrices rather than scalars that gives you the matrix exponential. And that representation tells you immediately that the eigenvectors of A are the eigenvectors of this matrix and the eigenvalues go through the same transformation. Okay, and in saying this, I'm indeed assuming that there is a complete basis of eigenvectors, and that's certainly true for symmetric matrices. So there was a question about this earlier. At least in this case, it's fair to assume this. There is a complete basis of eigenvectors, so we can do this. Uh, Okay, and so we are interested in this quadratic form and we can bound this quadratic form using the Rayleigh-Ritz theorem or the Rayleigh's theorem. I don't know by what name you know this uh, or the courant fisher theorem, whatever. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so it's bounded by uh, the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, the spectral radius of this matrix, which is e to the beta rho minus one times t times, uh, okay, one transpose one, which is n. Okay, the inner product of the all one vector with itself is n. So you get this bound on the quadratic form and substituting that back. The epidemic lifetime is bounded by the lifetime of the, uh, branching random walk, and that in turn is bounded above by this quantity. It's also a probability, so we can take the, the sorry, the min of one and this, not the max, but the min. It's bounded by the minimum of uh, one and this bound n e to the minus this. Okay, I'll stop again in case anybody has a question. That was maybe a bit of calculation. Okay, no, everyone's happy. Okay, so we get an explicit bound on the tail of this random variable tau, which we are interested in. And we can also turn it into a bound on the exponential, uh, sorry, on its expectation simply by integrating. So the the expectation of tau is the integral of this tail probability. And if you use the upper bound one up to this time log n over one minus beta rho, you get the first term. And then you use this bound. So, so this is where the second quantity becomes one 
until then it's bigger than one. And so you use the other bound from t equals this to infinity and you integrate and you get whatever was claimed in the theorem. So that completes the proof of the theorem. Uh, so this gives us a condition under which the contact process of the SIS epidemic is guaranteed to have a short lifetime, logarithmic in the number of nodes. Okay, so that completes the proof and it's a good point to take a break. And when we come back, we we'll look at the converse result. When can we guarantee that the epidemic has a long lifetime? And then we'll look at some examples. Uh, sorry, thank you, Ganesh. Sorry, it's, do you use a PDF here or it's something different? Uh, sorry, yeah, I use PDF. So, so then, then look at this X journal, uh, this uh, program. You may easily correct uh, what we are doing, make, make, make corrections using that. Okay, yeah, I will, yeah. You, you I'll know, do it on LaTeX now, but yeah, I'm, I know I should get started on that so I can do it uh, live, but... Uh, yeah, yes, yes, it's easy to do live, so it should be mean instead of max, and then you can do it easily. So it's your, your, your colleague, I think it's... Uh, Takis, to, uh, I told you about the Takis, yeah. Mm, yeah, 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 you sent it's me the link. Exactly, and this guy, so yes, it's very good uh, program which allows you to correct everything here. Okay, I haven't yeah got familiarized myself with it yet, but yes. Uh, did I tell you this name? This name, John X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sent me a link to it last time. Yeah, I think it's, you, you could you could try to, to implement. You get into place. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, what time should we start? Quarter past eleven. Uh, I, I think we can continue continue at. 17 15 okay. maybe or 11 15 by bristol time yeah okay uh okay so there is a break now uh we continue our election at uh 17 15 or 11 15 by bristol time let's send ganesh and see you yeah see you in a bit Марина, ты знаешь теорему Реле и Рица? Реле и второй Риц? Ты не погуглил? Я погуглил, но какая-то какие-то гидродинамические теоремы находятся. Какие? Гидродинамические. Ну, по Релею похоже. Я не знаю, что это такое. Я что-то... Не знаю. Он читал, добра. Ну, по, по ходу, да, что-то со собственными числами, но я не понимаю, пока надо спросить. Ну... А вы ссылку попросите? Да, вот э, и хотим это сделать. Есть метод релериц. Да, вот какой-то, насколько я понял, вычислительный метод. По крайней мере, на Википедии на русский про него такая статья, на английской не особо прочитала. Есть книжка. Eigenvalue Problems Relayeritz Method. Это в Википедии или нет? Нет, это просто было. Ага. Ну, это даже достаточно простое свойство, так что вам полезно будет разобрать. Хорошо. Угу. А, а, где, а где же Женя Евгений Игоревич? Подключится, наверное, сейчас. Нет, ну, видимо, занят где-то его нет. Окей, ну все, ладно, Ганич подключился. Угу. Oh, Ganesh, uh, unfortunately, the relay reads theorem is unknown for us. Uh, maybe you can uh, give some links uh, for us. That, and, and uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's a theorem that um, about the, max, the maximum of 
X transpose AX over X transpose X for uh, Hermitian matrices say. Mm -hmm. So is there some name by which you know this quantity, these quadratic forms? Um, let me, uh, okay, I'll try to send a link. Uh, yeah, there must be some Wikipedia page on it. Uh, relay reads method uh, uh, only that I can find. Uh, method, and... Okay, uh, there should be a theorem as well somewhere. Yeah, Wikipedia has the method. Um, no, that's not good. Okay, then there's something called the Raleigh quotient, which is the same thing. Uh, mm. okay, I'm trying to find the exact formulation I want. Thank you. Yeah, there's a planetmap.org page which has it. Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay. I see. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Should we start or wait a bit? Yeah, yeah I think we can start. Yeah, it's not okay. Uh, okay, so we finished proving this theorem about an upper bound on epidemic lifetimes. So we'll now look at uh, lower bounds. Uh, okay, so I need to define uh, in order to state the result, I need to define one more quantity called the expand isoperimetric constant of a graph. Uh, so um, let's start with that. So fix some uh, integer n smaller than n over two. And we'll define this generalized isoperimetric constant eta m this way. So what are we doing? We pick a subset of vertices S, non-empty, with at most M vertices. Uh, we look at the total number of edges going from S to its complement, and we divide by uh, the number of vertices in S. So if you think of the set uh, as the size of the set, as the volume of the set, and the number of edges going from S to its complement as its surface area, this is the ratio of surface area to volume and this, um, and the question of minimizing this is a, is a famous problem called the isoperimetric problem. And we know that uh, at least the answer in D dimensions is the sphere is the one that minimizes this ratio. Okay, the proof is hard, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it's a well-known result and that maybe motivates the name for this quantity. This is called the isoperimetric constant. Uh, usually we set M equals N over two in defining it and uh, we, we want to slightly generalize this and make it a function of M. Uh, and now uh, we can state our theorem about the lower bound of the extinction time. Uh, and it's as follows, if beta times so the upper bound said if beta times the spectral radius of the graph is smaller than one, then the epidemics are short-lived. And this says that if beta times the isoperimetric constant is bigger than one for some M, uh, then uh, the expected epidemic lifetime grows exponentially in M, okay? And depending on the examples, typically M will be some small fraction of N. So this says also that the lifetime is growing exponentially in N. Uh, but in some other graphs, maybe you can only have this large expansion up to some fractional power of N maybe. So that's why we have made this uh, 
definition more general, but you know, if the examples we look at them will actually be uh, typically, no, actually we'll see examples of both types, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, just to make this very intuitive, if n is going to infinity, we want to think of m as also going to infinity, maybe as fast as n, maybe a bit slower. And if the graph has big expansion for all subsets of size up to m, so if eta m is big, and if beta times the infection rate times this expansion parameter is bigger than one, then this epidemic lifetime is big. Uh, if eta m is very small, this result is still true, but it's not useful. And we'll see some examples of that as well. It's, it won't tell us anything very much by saying this. Uh, Ganesh, could we please uh, um, clarify? So, uh, I, I, as I understood, uh, it for in eta m, m is a free parameter, correct? Uh huh. M is a free parameter, and n is a number of nodes, number of vertices. Yes, and m is a function of m. Okay which is maybe hidden in the notation. You, are, you can let m grow with n. Ah, uh, m is an integer part of half of n? n or what? In no, no, no. <laughs> m, you can choose m. m is a free parameter, like you said, but it doesn't have to be a constant. It can be log n, it can be square root n. It's up to you. Yes. So if you put here on the right, you can put supremum in m? You can put? Supremum in m on the right in the theorem. Uh, you can put supremum in M and that, but that supremum may be achieved for very small M. So that is maybe not interesting. No, wait, wait, wait. So you have, you have a lower bound on e expectation of tau, correct? Ah, okay. In the theorem, you want to put a supremum on M. Yeah. Yeah. You can put a supremum on M in the theorem. Yeah, because it means the uh, yeah the worst scenario. So for all m, therefore you put supremum. Yeah, so you get it. Yeah, I thought you wanted to, to take the supremum of no, no, eta no. m alone. You take the supremum after raising it yeah, to the power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to look at which m uh, bring the main uh, contribution. Yeah. Which of m's? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so you can state this. Yeah, this is true for each M, so you can take the supremum over M on the right-hand side in the theorem. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that's the theorem, and now we'll turn to the proof of this. Uh, so the proof is again going to, uh, yeah, Sergey mentioned earlier that I should emphasize the techniques we are using. So the techniques that we are using uh, in today's lecture are basically uh, stochastic comparisons. Uh, so some uncoupling. So we want to find some process which is an upper or lower bound on the process we are actually interested in. And we want to show the, bound, the bounding by coupling. And then uh, we use this fact. Stochastic ordering and coupling are the techniques we are using today. Okay, so now we have yet another process. Now this is going to be a one dimensional process. It's just a Markov process on, on the finite state space, not one up to M plus one. And this has the following transition rates. So again, let's just keep the intuition in mind. We are trying to count the total number of infected nodes on the graph and uh, get a lower bound on that. So the total number of infected nodes is decreasing by one at rate proportional to the number of infected nodes. That's the second line here. So the Markov chain decreases by one at rate Z or Z uh, and it increases by one at uh, beta times the isoperimetric constant times Z uh, okay, and it can only increase up to this point. Once it's hit the upper boundary, it cannot increase. It can only decrease. That's the last term there, the indicator. Okay, so we have a Markov process here. And 
Again, the claim is that we can couple the stochastic process X of interest. Uh, this is a very high dimensional process and this one dimensional Markov process in such a way that if we start with uh, the same or a smaller number of infected individuals, then that stays the same for all time. So ZT gives a lower bound on the total number of infected nodes in the graph. That's the claim. Okay, uh, so let's first uh, see why this is true. Uh, again, not very formally, but intuitively. Uh, this, the second line is clear. So if the number of uh, infected nodes at time t is exactly equal to zt, they decrease at the same rate because the recovery rate is one for each node. Uh, what happens uh, if, uh, but what happens to the rate of increase of the number of infected nodes? That depends on where exactly these infected nodes are. It depends on the set. Uh, but if there are uh, k infected, if there are fewer than M infected nodes, maybe I need, yeah, if there are M or fewer infected nodes, then the rate at which they are infecting new nodes, if S is the set of infected nodes, let me go back, then the rate at which they are infecting new nodes depends on these edges. It's the number of edges to healthy nodes times beta. So the infection rate is beta times the number of edges. So it's beta times it's at least as much as beta times the isoperimetric constant times the number of infected nodes. Okay, just rearranging this inequality. So that's the observation we are using. So the rate of infection is at least this much. Uh, and so, so this coupling is possible. Uh, okay, so yeah, so I think that's what I have already said. So this coupling is possible. And now let's define tau hat to be the first time at which uh, this one dimensional Markov chain ZT hit zero, Markov process ZT hit zero, starting with just a single infected node, starting with Z, Z equals one, okay. We want a lower bound. So the worst case for the lower bound is if we start with one infected node. And then tau hat is the time for abs absorption in zero of this Markov chain, Markov process ZT. And then the epidemic lifetime is at least as big as tau hat. So if we can get a lower bound on tau hat, we have a lower bound on tau. That's, uh, that's the idea. Uh, Ganesh, I yeah. just a question. So you introduced process Z of T. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like it's a tram it's called a truncated linear burst and death process. Yes. It's exactly. So notation. So maybe you can mention that. That is, uh, if there was no indicator function, mm -hmm. the right, at the right, it would uh, it, it it will be called the linear burst and death process. And yeah. Indicator just truncated version. Yeah. Okay, yeah, just to, to notation, just to make a link. Yeah. yeah, 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 thanks. Yeah, so this is a well-known process. I'm going to yeah, give a name to the corresponding jump chain, but this process is the linear birth and death process, truncated because of this indicator at M, truncated at 10 plus one, okay? Uh, and this is a very uh, well-known process. Uh, so we can, so, so we, the answer to what is tau hat or bounds on tau hat are already known, though I will go through it a little bit. And the, so the substance really is this coupling, which says as a result of which we get that the epidemic lifetime tau is at least as much as tau hat, uh, the extinction time of this linear birth death uh, process. Okay, so if we look at the jump chain associated with ZT, this is just an asymmetric random walk. Uh, it, it has this fixed probability uh, of going right or up, and this fixed probability of going left or down. 
And uh, okay, so we want to, uh, so again, it's very easy to study this asymmetric random walk truncated at m plus one. So we start in state one. Uh, so it has some constant probability of hitting m plus one uh, before zero. Again, so we are under the assumption of the theorem, beta times a time is bigger than one. So this numerator is positive. So it has positive, strictly positive probability of uh, hitting the top boundary before hitting zero. And once it hits the top boundary, it returns uh, to it exponentially many times before hitting zero. So the idea is you have an asymmetric random walk. Its drift is upwards. You start at one. Because the drift is upwards, it has positive probability of hitting the top. Uh, and then once it's here, it's very likely to come back before coming all the way down. So it makes small excursions near the top, comes back with uh, probability close to one, in fact, exponentially in M close to one. Uh, and so it, the number of expected number of returns is exponentially large. Uh, okay, so this is just well-known results for the asymmetric random walk, or if you know them already for the linear birth death process, you can use that too. Okay, and so the, yeah, every time you're in state M, you again spend some constant time in that state. You have exponentially many visits. And so you put all these together, you get this lower bound on tau hat, which then gives you E tau hat, which then gives you a lower bound on the extinction time of the epidemic. Okay, so you have exponential lifetimes. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so these are the two uh, theorems for gen arbitrary graphs. So if beta times the spectral radius is smaller than one, uh, the epidemic lifetime is logarithmic in the number of nodes. <clears throat> uh, if beta times the isoperimetric constant is bigger than one, the epidemic lifetime is exponential in this parameter M, which went into the defining the isoperimetric constant. So these are the two upper and lower bounds. And uh, I'm sorry, isoperimetric co constant is sm smaller than uh, rho, yeah? Yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. So, okay, so I was going to say these two will be, uh, these two bounds will uh, match if uh, the isoperimetric constant is close to rho. They would even give a contradiction if the isoperimetric constant was bigger than rho. That can never happen. Uh, it's always at most the spectral radius. Why? You can prove that. Why it is so? Uh, why is it so? Because uh, because the isoperimetric constant is at least as small as the minimum degree. And, uh, uh, sorry, because the isoperimetric constant is uh, smaller, cannot be bigger than the minimum degree because you have one, uh, so you have an example where the if you take the minimum degree vertex, its cardinality is one, the number of edges is the minimum degree, and you're taking the minimum over all subsets of size at most m. So the isoperimetric constants at most the minimum degree, and the uh, uh, spectral radius is at least the minimum degree. In fact, it's between the minimum and maximum degrees. Okay, so I'll mention that again later. But it's always between the minimum and maximum degrees. So that's why it can't be smaller than the isoperimetric constant. Okay, so it can't be smaller than the isoperimetric constant. So there's no contradiction between theorems one and two. Uh, but the two theorems give matching bounds only if uh, rho and Eta m are close to each other. And we'll see some examples where that's true and some where it's not true. Okay. So that completes the proof of the theorem. If nobody has questions, we'll go to the examples. 
<clears throat> okay. Okay, so we'll start with the simplest example, the complete graph. <coughs> In this case, if we take the adjacency matrix and multiply by the all one vector, all the rows have n minus one once and a zero on the diagonal. So we just get this. So the spectral radius is exactly n minus one. This, this is a positive eigenvector. So this is the Perron eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue is the largest eigenvalue. Okay, and so, so we know rho, what about uh, the eta? Let's fix some positive epsilon, small, and let's take m to be epsilon times n, a small fraction of the nodes. Then if you take any subset of at most epsilon n nodes, there's one edge to everything in the complement. There are this many nodes in the complement. So the number of edges per vertex is at least this much. So the isoperimetric constant is exactly one minus epsilon times n. Uh, and so rho and eta are close to each other. So it's n and one minus epsilon n. So theorem one says that if uh, the infection rate times, okay, rho I've replaced n by n minus one by n, they are almost the same. So if this thing is smaller than, I, I, okay, I should have used a different delta here to not confuse with the epsilon, but if it's just a tiny bit smaller than one, then the epidemic lifetime is logarithmic. And if it's a tiny bit bigger than one, then uh, by the second theorem, this isoperimetric constant is bigger than one. So again, the epidemic lifetime is exponential in n with some constants. Ganesh, put a comment, please. Yeah. Epsilon is a rash, must be a rational number such that epsilon times n is a positive number. Uh, okay, yeah, or you should take integer parts to be Because of that, eta will be smaller, not cannot be bigger than rho. For example, if epsilon is one over n, you get equality. But yeah. You always get inequality. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I've, I've kind of thought of epsilon here as a small constant that doesn't depend on n and n is going to infinity, but yes, you, you yeah, you, you can allow epsilon to depend on n, but then yes, you should be careful about the integer paths, etc. So I'm being a little bit sloppy and looking more at uh, just the intuition. So take epsilon is 0 0.01 and n is a million or something and then these things work. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so then uh, here, so that epidemic lifetime has a sharp threshold at beta n equals one. So if beta n is, uh, if the infection rate is such that this is 1.001, you have long-lived epidemics. And if it's 0.999, you have short-lived epidemics for n large enough. And that's the sense in which we talk about thresholds here. Okay, another example. So that was the complete graph. So let's uh, look at the hypercube, uh, the d-dimensional hypercube. So we have uh, in each dimension, you have two vertices, zero and one, and then you take the product of these. So the total number of vertices n is going to be two to the d, where d is the dimension of the hypercube. Uh, and you let this go to infinity. And there's an edge between two vertices in the hypercube. So if you, you can label the edges by uh, zero one vectors of length d, that's what this notation means. And there's an edge between two vectors if they differ in at most one coordinate. So if the Hamming distance between these vectors is one, exactly one, sorry, if they differ in exactly one coordinate, then there's an edge. So that's the graph. Uh, okay, it's a regular graph. Each node has exactly D neighbors. You can flip one bit and get a neighbor. Uh, and for a regular graph, uh, oh, I should have written that. Uh, so rho, the spectral radius rho is uh, exactly D. 
because uh, that, that's true for any regular graph because the adjacency matrix, each row has D ones in it. So the all one vector is an eigenvector with eigenvalue D. Sorry, I forgot to write that. Uh, yeah, so the spectral radius is exactly D uh, and we want to calculate the isoperimetric constant. So now we have the D-dimensional hypercube. So let's take M to be two to the K. Then we are looking at a K-dimensional facet of this hypercube. Maybe it's easiest to visualize in three dimensions. So if you take D equals three, you have a cube. If you take K equals two, you have a square, which is one of the faces of this cube. And then you can, if you take all your vertices on the square, you can ask how many edges are there from each vertex to its complement. You have one remaining dimension in this example. So you have one edge more generally on a D-dimensional hypercube with a K-dimensional facet. You have D minus K remaining dimensions and you have one edge in each of these D minus K dimensions. So you have eta M edges, which is D minus K. So this is the isoperimetric constant. Okay, then of course, proving this, saying this is the worst case subset is hard, but that's true. Uh, somebody has proved it already. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, what, what you intuitively guess is the worst case is indeed the worst case. And, uh, so this is the isoperimetric constant. So the spectral radius is D, the isoperimetric constant is D minus K, and you can make them close by taking K small. So you are think, we are thinking of D, N, and hence D tending to infinity. So we can let K also tend to infinity, but slower than D. That's kind of what we have in mind. Uh, so the gap D minus K is also going to infinity. And in fact, D minus K is close to D. That's what we are thinking of. Okay, so our first theorem tells us that epidemic lifetimes are logarithmic in N if beta times D, spectral radius D is smaller than one and epidemic lifetimes are exponential in M, which is two to the K. Uh, and two to the K can be written as N to the K over D. And this is true if beta times D minus K is bigger than one. So here we have epidemic lifetimes, which are exponential in some fractional power of n. Okay, uh, not... Sorry, students in Russia are in familiar with notation capital omega. Ah, capital omega, sorry. Uh, capital omega is the opposite of capital O. So if you're familiar with the capital O notation, a sequence Fn is big O of Gn. If Fn is bounded by a constant C times Gn, and we say Fn is omega of Gn if Gn is capital O of omega. And I'll use little omega the same way. So Fn is little omega of Gn if Gn is little O of Fn. So omega is just the capital of, uh, sorry, is the opposite of O. So epidemic lifetimes grow at least as fast as exponential in a fractional power of N in this setting. Okay, and so there is again a sharp threshold at beta times D is one. So that's another example. Uh, okay, we can also do this on Edgerschrenyi graphs. So let's, uh, you, you are probably familiar with this, but let me define it anyway. So we have a sequence of graphs uh, with these described by these two parameters. N is the number of vertices. P is the edge probability. So there are N vertices in the graph and the edge between each pair of vertices is random. It's present with probability P independent of all other edges. So all these edges are independent random variables. IID Bernoulli random variables with parameter P. Uh, and P may depend on N, though we'll simplify notation and not make this explicit. Uh, 
This has other names as well. It's also called the uh, Bernoulli random graph because the edges are Bernoulli, but uh, Edges and Reni studied this model or more a related model in great detail and proved lots of things about it. And it's best known by this name. And I'll call it by this name. Uh, okay, and so let us denote by little delta the minimum of the vertex degrees and by capital delta the maximum vertex degree. Then the spectral radius for uh, is always between the minimum and maximum vertex degrees. So why is this true? Uh, so let's look at the adjacency matrix. It's a symmetric matrix, positive, okay. And all its row sums lie between uh, lowercase delta and uppercase delta. And that means that uh, the largest eigenvalue also has to be between them. Uh, you can think of it as, uh, so the eigenvector corresponding to rho has to be a positive eigenvector. And you can look at, uh, so th there's some positive vector x such that the adjacency matrix times x is rho times x. Look at what happens to the biggest coordinate x max of x and to the smallest coordinate x min. Uh, and uh, so x max cannot be amplified by more than capital delta. So rho can't be bigger than capital delta. And x min is amplified by at least little delta. So rho again cannot be smaller than little delta. Okay, so these bounds are just by looking at uh, what it can, what the action of A on positive vectors can be. Uh, okay, so having said this, so we are, so why are we saying this? We are going to use this to get concentration for rho. So let's look at uh, edge probabilities P, which are growing faster than log n over n. That's the little omega notation. Uh, log n over n is interesting because this is the threshold for connectivity for edges any random graph. So if the edge probability is uh, say 0.5 or 0.99 log n over n, the random graph is disconnected with high probability. And if it's a bit more, if it's 1.01 log n over n, then it's connected with high probability. That's a well-known thres connectivity threshold for additionally random graphs. Ganesh, I'm sorry. So you, you said that P over log n uh, over this fraction tends to infinity, yeah? That's what this notation means. P is uh, of log of this fraction. What does it mean? Uh, so P is omega of this fraction means that uh, P divided by this tends to infinity. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. NP over log N tends to infinity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, so there are lots more edges than are needed for connectivity. The, the proportion of edges need compared to what you need for connectivity is infinite, going to infinity. Okay. Uh, so it's relatively dense compared to the connectivity threshold, those sparse compared to the complete graph, where it's potentially complete, can be very sparse. So as an example, you could look at long squared n over n. That's one such sequence. Okay, so, but if, uh, if P is large enough for this, then the smallest and largest vertex degrees are both asymptotic to NP, meaning the ratio of these to NP tends to one as N tends to infinity. So the, the ratio concentrates at one. And so the spectral radius is also asymptotic to NP. So rho divided by NP tends to one. That's what this is saying. Uh, okay, so for, that's true of these edition random graphs. Uh, and then it's harder work, which I'm going not going to do, but you can also show that the isoperimetric constant also concentrates around this value. So if you look at subsets of size at most epsilon n, you can look at how many edges cross from s to its complement. Uh, that's binomial with parameters, which are the size of 
the cardinality of S times uh, P times the cardinality of S complement. The S complement is at least this many. So uh, this, the edge probability, uh, the size, the cardinality of the set stochastically dominates. That's this notation, this binomial random variable. So using the stochastic domination and uh, using concentration inequalities for this binomial random variable, we can show that the isoperimetric constant is at least as big as one minus epsilon NP with high probability. Okay, I didn't define this terminology with high probability either. So we have a sequence of random variables or events. We say a sequence of events occurs with high probability if the probability tends to one as n goes to infinity. So as n goes to infinity, the isoperimetric constant is bigger than this with probability tending to one. That's what this is saying. And so again, the spectral radius and the isoperimetric constant are close to each other. They are NP or one minus epsilon NP. And so again, there's a sharp epidemic threshold at beta times, this is the mean degree of the Edris-Renyi random graph. Beta times the mean degree equals one. So that turned out to be true in all the examples we looked at so far, by the way. For the complete graph, the hypercube, and the edges Renyi random graph, the threshold is where the beta times the mean degree is one. Okay, that's not true in general, but that's, I guess, the cases where we can easily calculate uh, these things maybe happen to be ones where this is true. Okay, so these are all examples where our theorem gave, theorems gave a sharp threshold where the upper and lower bounds matched. And here we'll now look at a couple of counter examples where the, that doesn't happen. Uh, so the first example is lattices. So let's take the d-dimensional integer lattice and look at some finite large box. So between one n to the d, for instance. So the size of the set is n to the d. Uh, then, uh, okay, and the edges are going to be nearest neighbors. Uh, we don't have to do this, but for convenience, I'm going to turn this uh, cube into a torus. So I'll identify opposite ends. So I'll wrap this around in each dimension. So if you're thinking of D equals one, let's take the simplest case. You have a line of points and I'm going to turn it into a circle by identifying uh, the vertex zero and the vertex n. Okay. And I do this in each dimension otherwise. So it's, it's a d-dimensional torus rather than a lattice. And the only reason I'm doing that is then the graph becomes regular. All the vertices have degree 2D, so rho is 2D. Otherwise it's very close to 2D, but it's a bit com it's some complicated expression. Uh, so let's not have to worry about that. Uh, but the isoperimetric constant for this is not big. In fact, it's tending to zero. Uh, so if you take, so the, the graph has n to the d vertices. If you look at a subcube within this consisting of m to the d vertices, think of m as much smaller than n, uh, then its boundary uh, has uh, a face of size m to the d minus one and every such face has d two d neighbors. And so the, the uh, isoperimetric constant becomes 2d over m. And what is an expander? S sorry, what is? Expander. Uh, okay, I haven't defined an expander. Uh, a graph is called an expander, okay, or a sequence of graphs uh, indexed by n are called expanders if the isoperimetric constant, uh, and there you should take n over two here, that's the standard notation for isoperimetric constants, if they are bounded away from zero as n tends to infinity. Okay, so there is some uh, epsilon so that all the isoperimetric constants are bigger than epsilon uniformly as n tends to infinity then such a sequence of graphs is called, are called expanders. 
but here for lattices, they are not expanders because their isoperimetric constant is tending to zero. D is fixed and uh, okay, we really want to think of M growing in some way with N. So we want M to go to infinity and if we do that, this thing is going to zero. Uh, so that's what happens on lattices. And so there's a large gap between the spectral radius and the isoperimetric constant. And so what does that tell us? Uh, so the first theorem tells us that if beta times uh, rho, so if beta times 2d is smaller than one, then the epidemic dies out quickly. Uh, theorem two tells us that if uh, beta times uh, one over M is bigger than one. So if beta is going to infinity, at least like M, then the epidemic lifetime is big. So there's a huge gap. If beta is smaller than a constant, it dies out quickly. If beta is going to infinity, it, uh, it survives for a long time. But if beta is large, but not growing to infinity, what happens? We don't know. Okay, so there's a huge gap between the two theorems, but on the lattices results are known. It's known that there is some fixed constant beta critical, which depends on dimension. Uh, but so there is an epidemic threshold. It's at that fixed constant beta critical, but uh, it's not at 2D. Beta critical is not one over 2D, it's something else. Uh, this is just a loose lower bound on beta critical. Uh, and so uh, we don't really, our bounds don't capture the critical value on lattices, okay. And I want to finish with one more example, which is the star graph. So we have a hub and N minus one leaves. So the adjacency matrix is zeros everywhere, except on the top row, you have ones corresponding to edges from the hub to the leaves. And the first column, we have ones for leaves to the hub. So we can write it as the sum of these two rank one matrices. So you take a column vector times a row vector in these two ways, you add these up, you get the adjacency matrix. So it's a rank two matrix. We can calculate its eigenvalues explicitly. So square root 10 and minus square root 10 are eigenvalues for these eigenvectors and everything else it's rank two so all other eigenvalues are zero so rho is square root 10 so this is our spectral uh, radius but the isoperimetric constant is just one because if you take any leaf it has only one edge to the hub so the isoperimetric constant is one so again there's a big gap between the spectral radius and the isoperimetric constant. So our theorems, there's a big gap in what our theorems tell us. So if beta times square root 10 is smaller than one, epidemics die out quickly. If beta is bigger than one, the epidemics die out slowly and what happens in between is unknown. Uh, okay, so we saw some examples where the theorems work, some examples where it doesn't work. Uh, and I think that's as much time as I have. Uh, so I'll stop here. So there are two ways we could proceed for next time. Uh, I think I could spend a fair bit of time going over the analysis of the star and saying in detail what happens. Uh, and okay, the, the only reason the star Maybe the main reason the star is interesting is it tells us what happens in these so-called scale-free networks, networks where the node degrees have a power law de degree distribution. Uh, and so uh, we can talk, we can say things about the epidemics on scale-free networks by analyzing the star in detail. The other option is you have the seminar and that's all in the slide. So you can simply do that in the seminar and I stick with the original plan and talk about random walks for the last lecture. So maybe you can discuss that and tell me later what you would like to do, but it's probably good to stop now.
Yeah, I think this is a good idea. It's a good idea. We uh, discuss this lecture in the student seminar, and uh, after that, we will write you uh, our opinion about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now I ask all participants to turn on your video and send Ganesh for the beautiful lecture. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe someone has uh, uh, questions or comments, please uh, ask it. I would ask many questions. Maybe I, I shouldn't. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's send Ganesh. I think the end of the lecture was a little bit uh, too fast to students, my feeling. Is, uh, uh, the examples or the proof, proofs of the theorems? No, no, yeah, the proofs, the proofs, uh, the ideas behind was uh, you can show whatever. I think it's even the coupling ideas. They, 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 you know, the uh, up theorem one, theorem two, for example, yes, just that with the coupling construction, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not obvious. Uh, it's not obvious. You have to spend some time thinking about the coupling to convince yourself, but it's very awkward to write. So I didn't want to write it. Making it formal is huge amount of notation. I, I, I the intuition is actually clearer, I think, than writing it formally. But yeah, no, the, the main thing is yes, uh, the, uh, the original process and uh, you, the idea is you have this continuity, whatever, what is it, uh, from the right, on both sides, you cannot uh, have two simultaneous events because of continuous time. This, this, is, the, this is the idea. You cannot jump by minus mm. two. You have to yeah. jump one by one, and that's why you, you are still, if you are above, you're still above. Yeah. Events can attack Yeah, yeah. So when you're above, you're above. You could even think of, uh, you could even let the two processes evolve independently when they don't have the exact same value. But when they meet, that's the only time you have to be careful to make sure that the jumps of one process are a subset of the jumps of the other so that the coupling is maintained. So for instance, in the branching random walk, uh, so you ensure that if infection spreads in the epidemic process, the branching random walk also has one child when the two things are exactly in the same state. Mm -hmm. And the rates are such that you, the rate of having a child is bigger, so you can always ensure that every time the infection passes, there is at least one child. And at other times, you can let them be independent, et cetera. No, it would be nice, uh, Pasha, Marina, it would be nice to, to, to discuss the correct coupling. So do it in bearing stuff, you know. So you may think about the following, that, okay, we may discuss it separately. Uh, there, are, you, there may be some false jumps, you know. So yes, if upper process jumps, the lower process either jumps down as well, but it may stay again. You may jump, you, you're allowed to jump, of, uh, to have a jumps of size zero then you can make complete coupling. Mm -hmm. uh, like that. Yeah. Okay, we will discuss it separately, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Another questions, comments? Okay, let's send Ganesh again. Thank you. And our lecture is over. Thank you all for participating. Okay, and the date and everything will be decided later. Yeah, I, I, I think here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What means later? Uh, this year? <laughs> uh, now we in a, discuss the In date. two or three weeks, it will be. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you are starting to teach Ganesh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it won't but, but be... The main problem, sorry, but, but the main problem is that we don't have enough time to understand everything like very good, let's say. Because last seminar, we spent two or three hours and we understood only one thirty percent of 
the previous lecture. So it, it seems that we need like more time to. Uh -huh. to work. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it it was our, our like decision question can is Ganesh could make lecture a little bit later, not on the next week. No. And as I understand, it will be 14 or 21 October, something like this. Uh, I emailed to say I'd like to do it on Wednesday instead of Tuesday because it clashes with my teaching on Tuesday. Okay. Mm -hmm. That works. So, so we will make question here. Yeah. Is everything is fine for Wednesday and then we will write to everyone. Yeah. Am I right, Pasha? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. and our next seminar will be on Friday, Friday at the same time, yeah, yeah. as usual. So if you like me to to help you with something in Russian, I, I, I'm happy to do this. Uh, okay. <laughs> just, just, yes, it does. Okay. Talk but about are you sure that you can... Another option, another option might be to ask Ganesh to do the following. You you give uh, an, another lecture on something, but in addition to that, you may have a meeting, informal meeting, when you answer questions, uh, which uh, uh, the participants cannot uh, solve, yeah. Uh, maybe it would be nice, but up to now we can solve the questions. We can, you can solve everything, yeah. Yeah, by by ourselves, but we need time for this, and the only one problem was time. Okay. Okay. So it was like three seminars between lectures was very good. I mean, it was very. It was enough time, yeah. But one seminar between lecture, it was not so enough. Okay. Thank you. So not enough. No, not enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thanks, Ganesh, again. Yeah. See, see you next time. See yeah, everyone see you next time on Friday. Сергей Георгиевич, мы с вами сейчас поговорим. Отдельно вы позвонимся. Окей. WhatsApp. Bye, WhatsApp. Yeah. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.